Would you take your copy of God's Word with me this morning, and would you open it to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, and would you look with me in verses 4 through 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Would you stand with me as I read aloud from the Word of God? If you don't have a Bible, please use one of the pew Bibles. We provide them for that reason so that everybody can see the Word of God, hold it in their own hands, and see it for themselves. We're dealing with something very big here today, and that is not what we once were. Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, well, that's a good start. But God, who is rich in mercy... Because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace, you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Would you bow and pray with me, please? Father, we thank you so very, very much for this precious moment, time, and privilege to be together again with our brothers and sisters in Christ. May this be a time where we are listening very closely and very carefully to what your word says to us. Thank you, God, for this powerful word that talks about how rich you are in mercy. And because of your rich mercy, sinners like us were saved and spared from eternal judgment and condemnation. And now, Lord, as we listen to you, would you help us to take these things in, whether we are saved or lost, that we would understand what's at stake here, that these are truly big things, because you are truly a big God, bigger than we can imagine. We praise you for your strength, your wisdom, your power, your grace, your mercy. And we ask now that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, through your word, as we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, the one who deserves all the honor, glory, and praise. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. These messages are intended here, we started last Sunday, to get us thinking about God's plumb line. You see the title there in your bulletin, Bringing Our Lives to God's Plumb Line. And we talked about how plumb lines are used to make things straight, okay? Now, we aren't quite there yet to talk about the plumb line, but when we get there, we'll probably, you'll probably want to go back and look at some of these other things because God's plumb line is a very testing and a very challenging thing. We're sort of coming in the back door on this idea or this series of messages as we set the stage here and focus on some truths that the Apostle Paul shares for us here in Ephesians 2. We were there last Sunday morning and evening, and we will be there again this evening, Lord willing, as we are this morning. I trust that in due time, you'll see the importance of looking at all of these verses and these subjects that we've looked at for these last two Sundays. The great British preacher from years ago, the fellow named Martin Lloyd-Jones, pastored in London at the Westminster Chapel for quite a while. And he wrote a commentary on the book of Ephesians years ago. And when he wrote about Ephesians chapter 2 here, he said something very interesting. I found this very, very interesting. See what you think of this. He wrote, quote, The best way to get rid of small things is to look at big things, unquote. The best way to get rid of small things is to look at big things, unquote. You agree with that? That makes sense? I, I think it's true. When big things come along, people get rid of the small things. They forget about the small things. There are so many small things that we're occupied with today that we think are so big and so important, but these things just fall away whenever something truly big comes along, really, really big. It's been proven that in times of war, that the number of people going to psychiatrists and psychologists for help goes way, way down. It drastically declines when war comes along. Isn't that interesting? Ever thought about something like that? That when war times come, people go to shrinks and psychiatrists and psychologists, much less. Why would this be? Because the big thing is war. That's the big thing in front of us. And it's caused people to forget about the small things and their other problems. They're focused now on the big thing. What's going on with the war? Things that they thought were important before have now become small and trivial and they don't need our attention so much. Today, many Christians are occupied with small things, I'm sorry to say to you, 
Their commitment to church attendance is small. What you are doing right now by being here in the house of God, do you understand you are in a very, very small minority of people? Most people in Franklin County, St. Clair, Lonedale, Washington, Union, doesn't matter. They're not in the house of God on Sundays. They're not. What you're doing right now is very rare, increasingly rare in our culture. The commitment to church attendance is small. How many pastors and, and, and preachers have fought for this? They, they're just trying to keep the people of God committed to attending church. Now that ought to be just a given for every child of God. Would you all agree with that? That's a basic thing. Would you all agree? That's a basic. If you have made a profession of faith back years ago and you're still fighting this war, this battle with attending church, then you need to stop and examine yourself and see where you are with God. If this is a struggle, just to come to the house of God, ask yourself, why is this such a struggle for a child of God? This is the easy stuff. This is the simple stuff, the basic stuff of church attendance. The Word of God puts heavy demands on us in other ways, but church attendance ought to be just a given for the child of God, something we do on a regular basis because we want to be in the house of God. Amen? We want to be there. We want to hear from God. We want to sing to God. I talked to a lot of pastors today, and most pastors will tell you the commitment to church attendance is very small today. It's not a big thing. It's a small thing. The appetite for worship is small today, too. The ability to risk, to resist temptation is also small today. The concern for unbelievers and their eternal destiny is very small today. Very few people ever share their faith with anyone. Church leaders spend a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to come up with programs and promotions that will carry the people of God out of these small things into the big things. But I'm here to say to you this morning that there never has been a program or a promotion that will take the people of God out of small things, and there never will be such a program or promotion. I am convinced that the only way that we as the people of God will ever come away from the small stuff and get into the big stuff is if we look at the big things of life, of what we once were and what we now are. I think that will get us out of the small things. If we look at the big things of what we once were and what we now are. These are truly the big things. If you're sitting here saved, you know God did something very, very big for you, did He not? Very big. What we once were and what we now are. We've spent the last two messages looking at what we once were. We talked about here in Ephesians, in these first three verses, what Paul says about us. And it's not a pretty sight. When you look at, back at verses 1, 2, and 3 of Ephesians 2, this is not a pretty sight. And we need to be reminded of this, I'm convinced, more and more. According to these first three verses, Paul says right there in verse 1, we were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead. Dead. He says we followed the course of this world down there in verse 2. He says, we blindly obeyed the God of this world. He calls him the prince of the power of the air. He says, we were dominated by the lusts of the flesh and the desires of our mind in verse 3. And we dwelt on that and we talked about that in each of those past two sermons a, a week ago. And I brought to you this principle as we looked at those things. The greater the things you believe that God has done for you, the greater will be your desire to serve the Lord. If you believe God has done something really great for you, then you won't have a problem serving Him now, will you? Because you believe God did something really, really big and great and wonderful for you. You tell me what you think about your pre-conversion, what we called the B.C., before conversion state, and I'll tell you how much... You want to serve the Lord. A lot of people are confused at this point. A lot of people say, well, I'm saved all right, but I didn't need much saving as it was because, you know, I'm just pretty good as is. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I hope no one in this room says, you know, God's just pretty lucky to have me on His side, folks. That is not the case at all. What does He say there in verse 1? Dead, dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible doesn't say that you were snick, or sick rather, or had a, a case of the spiritual sniffles. No, 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 no. The Bible says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Stretched out there in the spiritual graveyard, as it were, and with spiritual grave clothes on, with your grave and your name on it. That's what you were before Jesus saved you. You were dead in your sins. Dead. 
Now, you, you were this mystery, by the way, because you were physically alive and spiritually dead at the same time. And all these things proved that you were, your deadness, by following the world's thinking, the world's doing, by blindly obeying Satan, he spells it all out there for us, by satisfying the lust of the flesh, because we're in that state of spiritual deadness and physical life, we had judgment, we had condemnation written all over us. That's what we deserved. We deserved to be punished and judged for our sins forever. Some people think that condemnation is something that's completely out there in the future. Well, that's just all yet to come. There's no, there's no condemnation now. But the Bible tells us that those who are apart from Christ, if you're sitting here this morning and you're not saved, you don't trust in Him. You are already in the process. You are already being pressed out here. This has already been, been spelled out for us here. It's going to be carried out in eternity. Yes, it will be. But it's already present now. You're already condemned if you're apart from Christ this morning. You are under the sentence of divine wrath. Now, Paul uses phrases here, a phrase down there in verse 12. Go down there in chapter 2 to verse 12. He spells us out some more that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Look at that last phrase, having no hope and without God in the world. If you're sitting here lost, that's who you are. You have no hope, no help. You are without God. Folks, you don't want to be in that boat now, do you? That's not the place you want to be. Do you realize what it is to be without hope? That's what we once were, Paul says. Without hope, we had no hope, no help. There was nothing that we could do for ourselves. We were helpless and hopeless. Someone has said, well, where there's life, there's hope. But there was no life in us. What's verse 1 say? We were dead, not alive. We were dead. There was no hope in us, no life in us. So how does a dead person hope for anything? He's dead. She's dead. We were hopeless, Paul says. Now, if you heard these last two messages last Sunday, you may be saying, well, this is all very depressing. You know, I need to get something to lift my spirits here. I don't know why the pastor wants to talk about all this. It's all so discouraging and depressing. The reason I've been talking about it is so you would appreciate what I'm about to say to you. In verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2, you talk about a bright ray of sunshine breaking through the gloom that Paul has spelled out in verses 1, 2, and 3. Here it comes. Look at verse 4 with me. And feast your eyes on this. Look at verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Folks, that's some really good news, is it not? We were dead in our sins, but God is rich in mercy. Now that's good news. The Apostle Paul says, we are not what we once were because of God who is rich in mercy. Feast your eyes on that. He's talking to Christian people here, the people in the church at Ephesus. And he says, we're not what we once were because God has done something. God has taken action. God stepped in. God did something. I thank God for those two little words in verse 4, just three letters each. They start verse 4, but God... Doesn't that give your heart some cheer today? But God. But God. I think those are the most wonderful words in the whole Bible. And I'll say it in all of history. There we were, hopeless and helpless, dead, condemnation all written all over. But God, God steps in and God does something that we cannot do for ourselves. Thank the Lord for those two precious words. They are precious words. I rejoice in those words today because I identify with those words. I identify with that description of me back in verses 1, 2, and 3. Now, if you don't identify with that description in verses 1 through 3, and if you don't agree with what Paul says about you in verses 1, 2, and 3, then those two words, but God, are going to mean very little to you. They won't mean a thing. They won't matter much to you at all. But if you agree with what he writes in those opening verses, there are going to be, th these are going to be exceedingly glorious and precious words for you, but God. I was dead in sins, but God. I was dead, but God took action. God did something. God saved me. This is the whole gospel in a nutshell here, if you, if you will, and wrapped up there in verse 4. It gives the glory to God. That's where it belongs. 
Salvation is God's plan. Salvation is God's work. In verses 4 through 8 of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul pulls back the curtain, as it were, so we can get a little glimpse, a little peek here of seeing the saving work of our God. What was God doing? And I want to turn your attention today to three things about the saving work God has done in the lives of His people. If you're sitting there saying, well, I'm already saved, I already know this stuff, let's be sure we know it, okay? Let's be very sure. Paul mentions these things in verses 4 through 8. First of all, I want you to see morning with me, exactly what God did. That's the first thing, what God did. Secondly, why God did it. And third, and finally, how God did it. We are in the area of what someone has once called infinities and immensities. These are the deep things of God, the big things of God. For God to save a sinful person like us, folks, that is big, is it not? Try that again. That's really big, is it not? That's big. That is big. All we can do today is just barely scratch the surface here of these three things. Folks, this is not just some sort of philosophical or hypothetical lecture. Oh, no, no. This is so much more than that. This is true of every single child of God. If you're sitting here saved, this is true of you. I'm talking about you today when I talk about what God did, why God did it, and how God did it. I'm talking about you and your sins. I'm talking about you, my brother and sister in Christ. I'm talking about something that's true for every child of God, every single child of God. So look what Paul says here about what God did here in verse 4. For these Ephesians, for people who are saved, here's is what God did. He gives three phrases here in verses 4 and 5 to answer that question of what did God do. Here's the first one. In verse 5, he says, he made us alive. Then in verse 6, he says, God raised us up together. And then again in verse 6, he says, God made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. These three phrases, made us alive, raised raised us up together, and made us sit in the heavenly places, summarize what God did and has done for each and every one of us who know Him as our God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made us alive, He's raised us up together, and He's made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let's look at these three phrases. Here's the first one. He's made us alive. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Another word for that word, or that phrase, made alive, is quickened. Maybe if you've got King James, it might say quickened. He has quickened us. He gave life to us is what that means. There we were in the spiritual graveyard, as it were, lying out there in our spiritual graves, such as they were, Alive physically, but dead spiritually. And you know what I'm talking about if you're saved. And the Bible says God comes along in that spiritual graveyard and He made you alive. He made you alive, my brother and sister in Christ. You were dead in sins and trespasses, but God made you alive. Aren't you glad about that? He made you alive. He quickened you. He made you alive. You were dead, but He gave you life. God did this. Salvation is His work entirely. Folks, you understand, this is God's idea. It starts with God, and it ends with God. This is God's plan, God's work. Testimony of Scripture is God comes into the spiritual graveyard where we were dead in our sins. He saw you in your grave there, child of God. He dug you up, and He took your corpse out of the ground, and He breathed into your nostrils the breath of life into your dead body, the life of God, and He made you alive. That's what the Bible says. But the next thing He says is He raised us up together. Look at verse 6. And raised us up together... With Him. Hmm. Now, dead people belong in the graveyard. You know that. That's where dead people are. But living people don't belong out there. They don't. They don't belong in the graveyard. Why? Because they're alive. They're not dead. So God has not only raised us up, but He has taken us out of the graveyard. He's brought us into the world of life now because we are living people. We're not dead anymore in our sins. He gave us life, so now He's brought us into the world of life. Before Jesus, you were dead. Aren't you glad He made you alive and brought you out of the dead place? Aren't you glad of that? Paul says one more thing here, third thing. Also in verse 6, he says, And made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Last Sunday night, we looked at this
before conversion, this B.C. state. And I stressed back there in verse 2 how we once walked, according to what Paul says, under the Holy Spirit's leadership, we once walked according to the course of this world. He said a lot about that course of this world stuff. We joined on that quite a bit. The course of this world means that we once thought like the world. We once did what the world did. We once behaved like the world behaved. Before we were saved, we were concerned about what we would call the earthlies. What's going on down here? Who will win the playoffs? And folks, can we just be blunt here? In eternity, who cares? In eternity, that stuff won't matter. We thought this world was it before we were saved. You all know people like this today, don't you? People who are apart from Jesus Christ, and they think this world is all that matters. It's all about this life. We've got false teachers running around saying, it's this life that matters. Your best life now, according to one guy. Folks, our best life is not now. Our best life is up there then, is it not? That's where our best life is. This is their whole reality, their whole truth. This world, everything about this world. They're concerned about earthly things. And that's where we all once were before God saved us. But look what Paul says there in verse 6 in Ephesians 2, the last part of verse 6. He says, he's made us sit together in the heavenly places. Not the earthly, the heavenly. Now people who are lost are concerned about earthly things. That's where we once were. But now he says, if if God's made you alive, He's made you sit in heavenly places. You're concerned about heavenly things, not so much about earthly things. There's a new dimension that's now in our lives, this heavenly dimension. Yes, the Christian has a concern about this world, yes, because this world is God's creation. I'm not trying to say we have no concern. God has blessed this world, and God has given us many things to enjoy down here. We know this. Folks, I'm glad when it's cold outside that He gave us these things called furnaces, aren't you? I'm glad we got those. I'm glad I can get inside this thing called a car and turn the heat up when it's cold outside, aren't you? My grandma and grandpa told a story about back in the 1920s. They would go around in a wagon with a horse-drawn wagon and pick people up for church even at nighttime with a lantern on the wagon. I'm thinking, how did the horse know where to go? And Grandpa said, because that horse made the trip lots and lots of times. He knew where it was. Folks, I'm glad we don't have to come to church like that anymore, aren't you? I'm glad. God's given us many things to enjoy in this world. But there's a difference here. There's a difference. While the unbeliever is concerned only about things down here in this world, the Christian has a new way of thinking, a new dimension in his life. He's concerned about the heavenlies, the heavenly things. And the Apostle Paul put it this way in a related passage. Go with me to Colossians chapter 3, just a moment, just a couple books over. Colossians chapter 3. And you'll see a lot of similarity here. Colossians 3 and verse 1. Paul writes, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. What Paul is saying there is since this is true of you as believers in Christ, he's not questioning this. He says since this is the case, the reality of it, since you, my brother and sister in Christ, have been raised up, From this spiritual graveyard, now be what you're supposed to be and set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. The Christian is at his best when he is most heavenly minded. The Christian is at his best when he or she is most heavenly minded. Years ago, a statement was going around. It's amazing how these things work. Somebody will say something and everybody will will just start repeating it and nobody will ever ask, is it true or is it not true? Here's the statement. Years ago, people used to say, well, don't be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. You ever heard that one? She is so heavenly minded, she's no earthly good. But the teaching of Scripture, folks, is that those who are the most heavenly minded are the most earthly good. They're the ones who do the most good. Why? Because their minds are on the heavenly things. They see beyond this world. 
They see the dimension of heaven. They know this life is not all there is. Aren't you glad this is not all there is? There's so much more. And they bring the dimension of heaven to bear upon life in this world. We not only are conscious of these heavenly things now, but we can go further and say that we are still on earth and we are in one sense already in heaven. Think about that for just a moment. How can this be? You might be wondering right now, has the preacher lost his mind? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're saying while we're down here, in a sense, we're in heaven? How can we already be in heaven while we're still down here on earth? How? Here's how, in this way. While the Christian is here upon this earth, he is in fellowship with the God of heaven. The Holy Spirit lives in the hearts and minds of every believer, does he not? That's that's God living in there. He, the, the believer has been brought into a heavenly fellowship with God. He is enjoying fellowship with heaven even now, even while he walks upon this earth. Paul says we've been made to sit together in heavenly places there in verse 6. That word sitting implies resting and relaxation. Christians are resting in the fellowship with the God of heaven that's been made possible for them. When it comes to this matter of fellowship with God, there is no work to be done, folks. Jesus did it all. We say it, do we not? Jesus paid it all. Jesus did it all. All we have to do is just sit, relax, and enjoy salvation. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I am not saying that there's no work for the Christian to do. What the preacher just said, eternal day off. That's not what the preacher said. That's not what he said. Verse 10 tells us, and we'll look at this tonight, Lord willing, He says in verse 10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, folks, He saved us to serve Him, did He not? That's what He did. He saved us to serve Him. We'll look at that tonight, hopefully. But God has already determined in advance that those who are saved by faith will live in good works. Now, please understand something. Our good works do not save us. Amen? Amen. Our good works do not save us. By the same token, we are not lost by our bad works. Our good works can't save us. Our bad works don't make us lost. There's a place for good works in the life of a Christian. But I've already said the important thing here. The place for good works is in the life of the Christian. There's no place for good works in becoming a Christian. No. Good works will never earn salvation. I've got family and friends who are Catholic who say, oh, yes, I can earn it. Oh, yes, I can. No, you can't. This is a gift, is it not? What does he say down there in verse 8? For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the what? The gift of God. God gave it. We don't earn it. We don't. All we can do is rest upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ when it comes to entering into fellowship with God. So this is what God did. He made us alive. He raised us up. And He has seated us in heavenly places. Now, that's what He did. Now, look with me at why did God do this. We looked at what God did. Now, why did God do this? And Paul gives a very clear, a very emphatic, a very triumphant answer to this question. Why would God do this anyway? Why would God walk into the spiritual graveyard, as it were, and make people alive? Why would God do that? Why would God bring them out of their graves and seat them in heavenly places? Why would God do all this? Well, the answer is right there in verse 4. Go back to verse 4 with me. Here's the answer. But God who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us. Why did God do this? Because He's merciful, because He's loving. God does this because He's rich in mercy and because of this great love. And that great love with which He has loved us, this is Paul's answer. God is rich in mercy. I'm glad God's rich in mercy, aren't you, this morning? Where would we be without the mercy of God? You've heard me tell it before and I'll say it again. Lady got her picture taken. She tells the photographer, this picture doesn't do me justice. And the man said, lady, you don't want justice. You want mercy. You know what I'm saying? That's what he said there. He's writing here to the Christians at Ephesus. And he says, you Christians there at Ephesus have been made alive because of an act of mercy. That's why from the heart, from God's heart of love, that's why you've been made alive. 
God did this because He was showing mercy and His mercy came from a heart of love. Mercy is one of those great words. It's a great, great word. It's a tremendous word. I love that word, mercy. We even have a hospital chain named after it, don't we? Mercy Hospitals. And I see acts of mercy from time to time. When I And when I see acts of mercy, I'm always moved by them. I see a family take in a homeless child. Folks, we've got something like that very close to us here in one of our families. That's an act of mercy to take in little kids who don't have a home. Sometimes I'll come across a situation where a brother and sister in Christ has been so deeply offended and so deeply insulted by someone else and they have every right to hold a grudge according to what the world says, as some would say it anyway. And yet that brother or sister in Christ forgives that person and they don't carry a grudge. That's an act of mercy. That's what that is. I've seen situations where people have owed lots of money to someone else. And the person who who was owed all that money simply forgave the debt. Just forgave it. They said, don't worry about it. Forget it. It's over. Don't worry about it. Folks, that's mercy. That's what that is. And I admire mercy every time I see it. Every time. But I want you to know this morning that there has never been and there never will be mercy such as God has shown to us in this work of salvation. Look again now at your spiritual grave with me for just a moment. There you and I were. This was not anything about you or me to recommend us to God. We had nothing to offer God. Remember what verse 1 says, we're dead. We have nothing to offer God. Nothing. We're dead. What can a dead person there in the grave offer God? The old commentator John Trapp wrote a long time ago, He says that we were, quote, rotting and stinking in the graves of corruption, much worse than Lazarus did after he had lain four days in his sepulcher, unquote. Why would God ever deal with such people as us? Why would God ever do anything for such people as us? Sometimes you'll hear preachers say, well, God saw something in us. You'll hear preachers say that. No, no, that's not the case at all. God did not save you because He saw something in you. There was nothing in you. There was nothing in me. We were dead. There's nothing in us. That's like saying, well, He's a nice-looking dead person, isn't He? That makes no sense at all. Isn't that a nice-looking dead person? Doesn't, Doesn't she look so natural? No, she looks dead. There's nothing there. There's no energy. There's no life. There's nothing there. All God saw in you and me was what John Trapp said, stinking corruption. So why did He save you? Because He had mercy, verse 4 says. The reason for salvation is not in you and me. It's in God. God has mercy. Aren't you glad of that? God has mercy. What do we say? God have mercy on His soul. We say that. Sometimes a little bird falls out of its nest and somebody will come along and see the little bird and pick the little bird up and put it back in its nest. Why does he do that? Now somebody might say, well, now you know why he did that. He picked up that little bird and he put it back into its nest because he knew someday that little bird's going to do something for him. That's why he did that. No, that's not why he did that. It's simple mercy. Mercy. The person who does this for the little bird simply has compassion on the little bird. He just feels sorry for the little bird, and he puts it back into its nest. The reason God has saved you, if you're saved in Him, the reason He did this is all in Him. The reason is in Him. It's it's Him. He does this. It's because He has a heart of love, and He's walking through the graveyard one day, and He sees you lying there in the graveyard, dead in your sins, and He said, let that poor, dead, stinking person come out of there, come out of that grave, come out of there right now. I'm giving you the power to come out of there. Then He begins to strip our grave clothes off us, and He covers us in grace clothes. Not grave clothes, grace clothes. It's all due to the mercy of God. Aren't you glad about that? Once you understand that, you will feel like singing those words that we looked at here a few weeks ago. That great old song from Frederick Lehman. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and it reaches to the lowest hell. 
Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Oh, the love of God. That's what saved you and me. If you're saved, my friend, you're saved because God loved you and God had mercy on you. Amen? Amen. Last thing. We talked about what God did, why God did it. Now, in these last moments, how did God do this? How did God do this? If I were you, if I were you, I do lots of things when I come to church. One would be to carry a Bible. Every time I come to the house of God, I'd carry a Bible. I never go to church without a Bible unless I went to one of those liberal churches where they don't believe in preaching anyway. But I'd bring a Bible. When you come here to St. Clair Southern the Baptist Church, bring your Bible. Then I'd also bring one of those ink-colored pens or highlighters with me, and, I, and I'd mark my Bible when I see things as I heard them preached. One thing I'd mark here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, is every time you see the word Christ... Go back with me now in these verses we looked at. Look at every time the word Christ is used. I'd highlight that. Look at verse 5. Paul says we're made alive together with Christ. In verse 6, he says we've been made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He says in verse 7 that God is going to show us in the ages to come the riches of His grace toward us in Christ Jesus. In verse 10, he says we've been created in Christ Jesus. There it is over and over and over again. We're created in Christ Jesus and the good works. And in verse 13, he says, we've been made near by the blood of Christ. Paul constantly talks about Christ here. The great truth he is emphasizing here is this. Christ is the channel through which the grace and mercy of God flows to us. This is how you get to the grace and mercy of God. It's through Christ. Salvation is through Christ. It is through Christ alone. Jesus did everything necessary for us to be saved. I don't have time to explore this with you this morning, but I could talk about why Christ came and what Christ did. But suffice it to say that there on Calvary's cross, the Lord Jesus Christ took the penalty of a holy God against the sinner, so there's no penalty left for the sinners to pay. Aren't you glad of that today? And through that redeeming work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God makes us alive. Some will say, well, how do I receive all this? The answer is we receive it by faith. Look at verse 8. For, gr- for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. This is how it becomes ours. Our salvation is provided by grace. It is received by faith. Provided by grace, received by faith. Look what Paul says there in verse 8. He says, by grace you've been saved. How? Through faith. That's how. This is how this redeeming work that Jesus Christ did becomes ours. It's through faith. Now, be careful here. Don't turn faith into some good work that you do to earn your salvation. We've already said nobody earns it. Nobody earns it. It's a gift from God. If you turn your faith into a good work that you did to earn your salvation, then it's no longer grace because you've earned it. That's how that goes. Salvation is either of grace or it is of works. It cannot be both. And it is not both. So your faith did not earn your salvation. Let me put it to you like this. The hands of grace are what we might say are the working hands of salvation. God's grace worked the salvation for us. And the hands of faith are the receiving hands. God works and we receive. All you can do is receive it. The work is done. You can receive it. Aren't you glad God did the work? Because we can't. God did. Now, I hope and pray today for two things as we wrap this up. If you are a child of God and you're not rejoicing over this message today, not because I'm preaching it, but because this is the truth about you and every one of us, then I don't know what else to say to you. God has taken action. God has had mercy on you. If you don't rejoice, I'm just going to say it, your rejoicer is broken, okay? Something's wrong with your rejoicer. I hope that every child of God here today will leave here today rejoicing. Can you imagine if you go to lunch somewhere today and we're done and you rejoice, they might think something's going on with you. 
They might think there's something different about you because they should think something is different about you, should they not? We're not supposed to be like the world. But if you are not a child of God this morning, I hope you will cast yourself upon the mercy of God. The mercy of God. If you're concerned about your spiritual condition, that's a good sign that God has already been walking in the graveyard where your dead soul has been. And He's already begun His work in you by making you think, you know, there might be more to this life than just earthly things. So I'm asking you to cast yourself upon His mercy. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to raise you up. Cast yourself upon His mercy. And if you'll do that, you'll find yourself coming out of the graveyard and you'll find yourself on the road to heaven. And you'll be rejoicing on that road to heaven because you will have life in Christ Jesus. Amen? Let's bow together and pray. Our Father and our God, we bow before You this morning. We thank You for this reminder that we were not, if we're saved, that we are not what we once were. If we're saved, if we're truly a born-again believer, follower, and child of God, and follower of God, You have taken us from the spiritual graveyard. You've taken us from death, death in our trespasses and sins, and You've made us alive. You've raised us up out of the grave. You've made us sit together with You in heavenly places. If we're saved, if we are truly born again, if we have confessed our sins to You, if we have asked You and pleaded with You and begged You to come and save us and forgive us and live in us through Your Holy Spirit, if we have put all our hope, faith, confidence, and trust in You and in You alone, we've been made alive. Father, we pray that's true for every person in this room, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, that they're saved, truly saved, from hell, saved from sin, saved from the devil, saved from death, saved from condemnation, saved from judgment. But if someone is here and they are not, Lord, as we sing to you in just a moment, would you help that man or woman, boy or girl, to put their trust and their confidence in you and in you alone and cry out for your mercy because you are rich in mercy. You have the biggest heart of love anyone could ever imagine. And you are more than able to save us, to save us to the uttermost. And if we are saved today, God, would you help us to see that we should rejoice in these things. We should be glad, happy, joyful, because you've saved us from death. Lord, you know the hearts and minds of each one here. You know what decisions need to be made. You know what commitments need to be made. You know what confessions need to be made. Whatever they are, God, would you help us to do them now and make them for your sake, for your honor, as we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.